Welcome everybody to our session today, which is the first session where we're going to cover payload. And specifically today, we're going to be having a look at payload science. Um, so before we actually go into that, what I'd like to do is quickly recap, where are we in our program? Um, uh, because uh, maybe, you know, for, for, for those of you who've actually been on the program right since the beginning, um, perhaps came on board late last year or, or in January, um, it may be a little bit fuzzy at the moment in terms of where are we. So, um, yeah, so recapping our process, um, what it is is that we started off with our uh, STEM starter kits. And uh, what we did is uh, for, for those, for those uh, participants who'd never actually seen an X chip before um, or one of these boards before, what we did is we, we had kind of like an, an onboarding, uh, we had some onboarding workshops, uh, how to build the starter kits, um, understanding the hardware and just running a few experiments. Um, then what we did is we moved into phase one and um, phase one is really where we have 12 sessions, uh, which is all virtual workshops and presentations. And uh, I'll go into a little bit more depth. So at the moment we are in phase one. And then what we're going to have is during June and July, we're gonna have a phase two. Um, and during phase two, uh, what we're gonna be doing is perhaps recapping some of what we've done in terms of payload, recapping uh, what we've done uh, when it comes to communication, really to understand um, our, our flight software um, and that kind of thing, because by then we'll all be working with our, our, our new flight hardware. And uh, yes, our suborbital flight is still scheduled for August this year. And then post-launch, uh, we will recover our kits um, and uh, the kits are going to be shipped back to everybody to analyze the data. So, uh, yeah, what we did is here's our, our, our STEM starter kits. There were some uh, workshops that were conducted during February. Um, and for those students who are actually on the Intelsat program as well, you'll see that there's a, this is very, very familiar uh, in terms of the, the experiments that we've been running. Uh, with our kits. So uh, we went through all of that and uh, then we went into phase one. So um, for the last three weeks, we've, uh, we've been in phase one and the first topic we covered was the C of C3PO and um, that was, and I've graded out, <laughs> um, non-clickable, uh, unless you wanna go and watch the recordings. And so uh, what we did is we covered communication and the science of communication. We had a look at uh, I squared C that we're using um, with our kits. Uh, we also looked at SBI um, and uh, what we're going to be doing is that in phase two, we're going to be covering CAN bus as well, because that there is uh, um, our new core, our flight hardware core is enabled with, with CAN bus. And uh, then we did the engineering of it. How exactly does this communication work? We were introduced to uh, the Arduino IDE. For those of you who wanted to get into actually starting to do some of your own code and really understanding the, 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 the code and the depth of the code. And um, then last week, we had a professional career webinar <clears throat> with Bianca covering uh, communication as well. So this is where we are today. Uh, March the 30th, we're having a look at payload science. So what we've got is we've got two iterations when it comes to, to payload science. And um, today is the first one. So um, before I go into it, let me see if there's any questions or any queries before, before I carry on and I start getting into the, the tall graphs. Okay, great. So now you're all going to see your new hardware that you're going to be receiving. So um, Cody, Cody uh, in Massachusetts has received uh, a whole bunch of kits. 
um, for distribution in the US as well as the Caribbean. And um, what we have is we still have quite a lot of the hardware here with us because we are sending kits to, um, to China. We're also sending kits across Europe and across the African continent. Um, so, so here it is. Uh, this, is your, this is your new core. Um, I think some of you have seen Bjarke holding it up uh, before. So here it is. You're going to be receiving it in the flesh. Um, ah, before I share my screen, um, I can see that there's a comment in the chat. Yay, J Jim, thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so um, it's, all, it's all happening. Uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, it's, it's all happening. So here we go. And um, there we have it. So what does our extended core have with it? We can see it here on the right hand side our extended core, it is, it's slightly shorter than three X chips long. Um, and that is because um, what happens is that it needs to actually then connect into the vertical stacking um, uh, interface uh, into the, the, the CubeSat format. So uh, we, needed, uh, we needed a little bit of, of a bit more space there. So it's not exactly 96 millimeters, which uh, 3X chips would be. Um, it's slightly smaller than, than that. I think, I believe it's um, uh, 84 or um, 85, somewhere around there, millimeters. So you can see, um, yeah, the, the extended core has the ESP32. So that looks very familiar. Um, so this is the back of my, uh, this is the back of my starter kit that I have. So you can see it's running exactly the same uh, core with the dual processor on it. What's really great about the dual processor is that you can also store data on board um, if you don't want to implement the, the SD card solution. If you're only gonna be collecting a relatively small amount of data, then you can just save the data on board. You don't actually uh, in, in the second processor. So you can have one processor for, for saving data and the other processor for, for processing and, and for, for running the code. Um, then you can see here this, this longish connector, uh, which is actually a, a ribbon for a ribbon connector is for a camera. So um, one of those tiny uh, Raspberry Pi cameras um, what you can do is that you can actually connect one of those. And then what we have is the, the SD card interface. So um, really, really useful, this SD card interface, because what, you, what we're going to do is we're going to be saving the data on that SD card during our flight, as well as um, transferring our data uh, across the board uh, through using canvas uh, to, to, to the main to the main structure of the payload bay. And then what we have over here is we have this we have this connector over here which is a 20 pin connector. Um, and that is because that was required for for the radio. So one day when we use this extended core for high altitude balloon missions, if you want to build your own tiny GS ground station to collect uh, LoRa radio um, uh, signals and data from, from satellites, etc. So if you, if you want to be using the radio technology, you're going to need that pin, uh, that, uh, sorry, that connector, that 20 pin connector. But then also you can see we have our prototype boards. So um, these these extensions uh, on, on, the, on the prototype board. So what I'm gonna do is let me actually stop sharing and then let me actually show you in terms of my camera. Um, here you go. So here we have, here we have a, a typical prototype board. Um, so you can see that this one over here, this one has I squared C, it also has a, um, SPI. Um, and this would require that uh, 20 pin connector, okay? If you wanted to prototype using that board. Um, then we also have some prototype boards over here, which are 
uh, straight I squared C. And as you can see, this is very much uh, a blank X chip um, with power and I squared C communication. So this, you don't have to populate this board. It'll work exactly the same as this blue, sh blue shift uh, blank chip that you have or any, any of the uh, uh, branded blank chips. So um, what I'm going to do is that I'm, I'm not going to be building any of my own sensors. I'm very happy with what I have already. Um, but the thing is that what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be flying a few of my sensors. And uh, in order to have um, a total of nine X chips to make up my payload, um, I may actually want to fill some spaces. So I may actually just use this as a, as a blank um, so that I've got, uh, so that um, what I can do is that I can use it in the same way as I use this one for um, redundancy in terms of, of, of power and communication and also just uh, mechanical strength. So, so yes, these are going to be really exciting. Uh, here is another one, another uh, much smaller, a little smaller prototype board um, as well using this, using this um, uh, 20 pin connector. And for those groups who are really wanting to do a lot of breadboarding, uh, we have 10 of these really big boards. Um, and uh, these are we going to be sending to those teams who are very, very far down the line in terms of their in terms of developing their own sensors. The likes of Taylor University, Princeton University, American University, they're gonna be receiving those boards. Um, they've been nagging Bjarka for something like this. So they're going to be receiving them. Um, apparently it was a complete nightmare to, um, as you can see all of these different holes um, and you know, this, this whole thing had to be rooted. So uh, that, that took some processing power and that took, uh, a little bit of sweat and tears to, to actually get that one going. Uh, before I share my screen again, are there any other questions or comments? Great, Jim, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's one of those things, um, either everything's like absolutely fine, uh, and so nobody has any questions, or otherwise it's like really not okay. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe, um, uh, Reza, thank you. Thank you, Reza. Um, always very, and Nico as well, very encouraging. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> right, let me, let me go back to, to, to where I was. Uh, fantastic. Great. Then, accelerometer, accelerometer, isn't that, Fantastic. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm now going to also just, uh, I'm going to stop sharing again, because what I'm doing is that I'm, you're going to be getting another one of these kits, another one of these very, very, very useful boxes. Um, and inside, here's your extended core um, with some bubble wrap to protect it. And by the way, when you do receive it, um, please be careful, because this this uh, this um, SD card holder is is very is very delicate. You know, it can flip open and that. So so yeah, really, just be be careful. Um, be careful with it. Uh, you know, maybe if you're not going to be using it, maybe just uh, I don't know, secure it somehow or whatever. Um, so that's why when we ship them, we 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 put this very nice firm bubble wrap on top of it. Uh, so that so that it held everything in place. Um, I think I'm actually going to. So here's the accelerometer. It's got a little rocket on it, like this. Um, and this is going to be measuring acceleration, x, y, z, or z, depending uh, where you're from. And um, this is going to be incredibly useful. Um, now, there's something that's very, very different about an accelerometer. Um, okay, before I go into that, I can see here there's a, there's a question. How can a team request the perf boards for custom sensors? Okay, so 
um, in effect, what you are receiving anyway is you are actually receiving all of these boards. Um, yeah, you can you can request one of these. Um, that's fine. You rec can request one of these. However, use what you have. Use what you're receiving because these are these are really these are really terrific boards. Okay, these perf boards. So um, yeah, see see if if and if it's not good enough, then fine. Um, then we'll ship you one of these. And I think what I need to do is right now I need to make it very very clear. If you want to develop your own sensors, and if you want to use these prototype boards, any of them, including this perf board, when it comes to the code and the coding libraries, you're on your own. We are developing the Arduino code for this extended core for your flight hardware, for all of the standard boards that we're sending you. The accelerometer, the, and, those sensors you already have in terms of your starter kit. We're doing all of the code for that, as well as the barometer that I'm going to speak about in a few minutes. Um, the SD card interface, absolutely. The camera, absolutely. Um, all of that. We're doing all of that code and we're doing those coding libraries. We are making sure that we can create the, the data packets so that you can save it on the SD card so that we can get it through the downlink. If you're going to be doing your own boards when it comes to coding libraries, you're on your own. We do not have the resources to support you in terms of that. Okay, um, Daniel, I see here. Uh, let me go back to the comments. Um, okay, Melena, I'm, I'm going to get your Melina question. question. Okay, Daniel, hi, hello. Good morning. Great. Daniel, thank you very much. Okay, so um, uh, if we get true complete data from T equals zero to apogee, okay, then we should be able to use our acceler acceleration data to get a velocity measurements in those directions, um, as well, assuming that uh, V uh, zero is zero. Yeah, the initial yeah. velocity is zero. Um, absolutely. Right. So yeah, because you're gonna be getting X, Y, and Z or Z, um, what you can do is you can then calculate the vector. Um, what's really interesting about accelerometers and what makes them very different from other sensors is that you need a very rapid rate of data collection because it's not, for example, like a temperature or atmospheric pressure or light, something like that, that you can measure every 10 milliseconds, every millisecond or whatever it is. What you need to do is that you, you almost need a continuous flow of data to be able to pick up the acceleration, uh, the movement, the pitch, your roll, G-force, all of that kind of thing. So, um, so that is why it's gonna be very, very particular in terms of the code for this accelerometer. And Bianca hunted high and low to find an accelerometer that had a really fantastic, where he could really have a fantastic library so that it was stable um, and so that we could really use it. So um, uh, he's, been, he's been hunting for at least six months um, and uh, he found it. So, so yeah, here's our, here's our accelerometer. We're very, very, very happy about this. Um, then we have the barometer and that is denoted with a little with mountain range uh, because with the barometer, you, you, what you can do is you can calculate, um, you can calculate your uh, atmospheric pressure. I've got a good mind, Daniel, to call this the Milena sensor. Okay, because <sighs> Milena who's joined us, she is, a meteorologist before she was a teacher. Ooh. Yes. And Milena delivered the most fantastic workshop for us uh, a week and a half ago on a Saturday for our, our, our team in Africa. 
um, on understanding our atmosphere, understanding weather, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very frustrating for her that we didn't have a pressure sensor or a barometer on the starter kit. So Milena, your wish has come true. <laughs> You're getting a barometer. Okay. Um, so this is really going to be fantastic in terms of measuring are we in vacuum or not? And how much vacuum do we have, micro vacuum, et cetera? Um, now, when it comes to designing the signs of your payload, there's just before I go away from these, I'd just like you to remember something. And that is when you set up your, your code in terms of your sensors, what you may want to do is you may want to set it up for. Let's take the barometer, for example. Do you want to set it up for uh, full atmospheres? Or do you want to actually set it up for micro atmosphere? Uh, do you want to set it up for kind of like close to, uh, to, to vacuum or vacuum? Um, and the same with the accelerometer. Because if we are going to experience maximum, what did they say, Daniel? I, say, I think they said something about maximum 5Gs. Uh, their license is for maximum five, five Gs of, of, um, of acceleration. Um, but then again, of course, we're going to have vibration, et cetera. So, you know, um, uh, instantaneous Gs may even be more than that. Um, it's impossible to calibrate your, your accelerometer for multiple Gs versus wow. the weightlessness when we reach apogee and we, we are weightless because there you want to measure micro Gs. So what I would recommend is that you collaborate amongst the teams and you decide who's going to collect which data at which point in the flight. So that what you can do is you can really get nice granularity and by combining all of that data, then you can get a really terrific profile uh, using your accelerometer. Okay, so Milena, I see you have your hand up. Please. Yes, Judy, thank you. I just want to mention about uh, the barometer. Um, can I have a bit more clarity? Uh, the payload, is it going to be inside the station or at some uh, situ situated outside the station? Because if it's outside the station, the barometer is going to be a useful tool to see actually how high above the Earth's surface uh, we are because uh, there is still some uh, remnants of uh, are you? pressure up to about 900 kilometers above the ground. So that's you, gonna be you, quite interesting to see. You, you, you're very, very correct. So with this particular mission, um, what it is is that we're not going as far as the International Space Station, but we're definitely going technically above the Kármán line into space. So we're going definitely over hundred kilometers uh, in altitude. Um, so yeah, the, the atmosphere is still <laughs> relatively thick at hundred. At, at, at 100 kilometers. Um, and the thing is, it's going to be, it's still going to be inside the payload bay, but the payload bay is not going to be pressurized. It can't be pressurized. So uh -huh. it is going to be exposed to that atmosphere around 100 kilometers. Okay, that's so you, my question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're definitely going to measure something there. Um, and uh, yeah, because there is this. Uh, there's certainly a, a fair, still a fair amount of, of, of air resistance, et cetera, um, uh, at, at that point. So yeah, uh, very, very, very good, very good question. Um, great, uh, let's, uh, let me go back to, sometimes, I'm very, very, very grateful that I'm blonde because when I get these like moments where I forget what I'm doing, I can always just blame it on being blonde. Great. So, and of course, you know, it's only blondes who are allowed to laugh at blonde jokes. Um, and I'm allowed to make blonde jokes about myself. Great. So um, prototype board interfaces. So yes, we're going to be have, we're going to receive our accelerometer, our barometer, our prototype boards. And then, sorry, not space, a spare, a spare USB power and um, programming interface. 
Wow. Uh, yeah. No, not only, uh, I've also had a few typos here um, five minutes before um, we, we came into the session. So yes, what I'm doing is that I'm uh, we, we sending you a, a spare a USB interface um, and programmer because are they just such use, useful things to have? Um, we're going to we're going to have power from the rocket, so you don't have to worry about batteries or your own power solution or anything like that. But definitely, when you're doing your desktop uh, work and you're using it as an engineering model, uh, you'll definitely uh, like that. And then just to show you quickly. Um, so this is the bag with the interface with the with the prototype boards. It, it looks like this. It's got this label on it. Of course, you're getting more of these connectors, um, and you're getting more blank uh, chips, um, so that you can use those uh, uh, as you will. Right. Do do I have any more questions before I start going into payload? I'm sorry. One of those being mailed. I didn't hear. Oh, okay. Um, no, absolutely. Um, Rob, at the moment, at the moment, the, the kits for the US are in the US. They arrived with Cody in Massachusetts yesterday. Um, so he's going to be sending those out this week. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you were, maybe, uh, maybe it was uh, before you came in, I was showing the different prototype boards, you know, like, for example, this, this is the large board that Mike Galvin's been uh, asking for for a year now or so. So um, we've also got one of these. So uh, we, we're probably going to be sending you one of these, okay? Yeah. It'll keep, to keep you busy or not. I like that. Okay. But there's plenty of these, you know, plenty of these. Uh, SPI, I squared C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, your, your extended core. Um, great. Uh, Daniel, um, should we start talking about the science of payload? Yeah, um, I, think Mo I think Milena kind of started going towards that way. So one of the things, right, that we wanted to focus on specifically with the with the science portion of the payload. So there's two sensors in particular that we were gonna kind of scaffold um, our discussions around and then give you guys as teachers the ability to kind of break off from those thinking about your own custom sensors if that's the path where you're gonna go, right? Um, but the accelerometer obviously is a big one that we want to focus on mainly because this is going to be the maiden flight for this, for this ship. So what that means then is that the data that students are collecting here in terms of that vibration profile, et cetera, that's data that has that will have never been collected. Right. And and one of the things that I'm that for me personally that I'm really stressing to my students is what the importance of being a part of that initial data collection is and how exciting that actually is as well. Right. So what what Blue Shift is essentially saying is, you know. We're, we're gonna let you fly on this maiden flight. And as a result of flying on this maiden flight, right? we're actually going to be able to utilize the data that you all collect. So one of the things that Judy mentioned is right, being able to collect across the range of different accelerations, right? So correlating that with different time, with different time slots, right? And different uh, intervals of time, we can actually be able to state what is happening then on that ship, whether it's you know from t equals zero to t equals ten, right during that initial burn, right to when it's in when it's on its way into apogee, right, and it's accelerating in the negative direction, right as it reaches that top. So students should be able to actually map out that process, right. So the big thing here is that we're kind of looking for those of you guys who are stateside, right, in terms of at the K to twelve range. Right, those next generation science standards, really what we're looking at is this relationship between force and motion. Right, what happens when it's no longer undergoing an acceleration due to the rocket engine, right? But instead it's under still undergoing this acceleration due to microgravity, right? So when it's in micro G's, what is it that we're actually reading? Right. Can we see that the rocket still undergoes an acceleration, even though the engines aren't on? Right. So there's opportunity here for students across the range of K to 12, right, as well as right more complex things at the collegiate levels. Right. But even between K to five, right, students can see, oh, wow, when objects are slowing down, right, that's still an acceleration that they're undergoing. Right. So then what's the object then that's actually causing that force to exist? So for myself being a physics teacher, right, really what I care about is kind of 
what that data being collected is actually showing us, right? What is it that it's showing the students? So there's all sorts of things that you can do in the context of mechanics here by being able to collect, right, that, that acceleration data, right? We uh, will know what the, what the fixed mass of the rocket itself is as well, right? So students can then be able to start thinking about, well, in terms of force versus time graphs, what is the impulse that the rocket as a whole undergoes? Right, and then thinking about it in terms of so then when they did the actual engine testing, what right, what was the impulse that they saw there? Right, and they should be able to kind of make those comparisons and those backwards um, connections to what it is that they actually observe in those contexts. So there's space and time that's kind of broken up here throughout the science portion of looking at what kind of data the accelerometer gives back to us, what it is that students know, right, or are, are going to know based on what blue shift gives us, right? And then what it is that is unknown that, you know, we actually have to collect that data for. Um, so some of the things that, that Nico stated, right, is that, you know, when we get that comp, that huge compilation of that data stream, right, in terms of accelerometer data, there are ways in Excel, right? So in the higher grades or in the, in the, in the older years, right, that they can go through and look at functions that can then decompose all that data to actually give you an output, those velocities, those instantaneous velocities. The nice thing about this specific launch that's different, in my opinion, is that our satellites are collecting at the beginning of t equals zero. And as soon as it actually does that, right, then we'll always be able to refer back to this idea, right, that the time intervals, as long as we go from, from zero to 10 and then zero to 20, right, then we can then backwards incorporate to what it is that the, the velocity changes look like from 10 to 20 as well, right, or in between. So the cool thing here is previously where we might have been locked out of being able to kind of know information about the speed because we don't necessarily know what the initial states are, right? Now utilizing that idea of the initial state being zero and along with the accelerometer data, we can then be able to make statements about what that final velocity should be. So all of this stuff, right? There's a lot of opportunity to directly kind of relate back to standards um, for the K to 12 band. Um, and then at the university event, really probably what you guys are more interested in is this idea of being able to actually create a vibration profile, right? And being able to create that vibration profile across the entirety of the rocket launch from, from T equals zero to Apogee as well. So I think there's a lot of exciting things there. Um, the teacher notes are going to kind of line, outline some of those activities potentially that you could go into and what some extensions might be. The engineering portion, which we'll talk a little bit further about next week as well, is going to be then how is it that students are going to make that decision on what data they actually want to collect. So Judy started to get into that a little bit as well, right? This idea of, okay, do you actually want to collect data in the range of zero to 5G? Do you want to collect data in the range of zero to 1G, right? Or do you care more about this idea of what that data looks like in micrograms? Right, so all of those things are gonna correlate with different time intervals. One of the really interesting things that our group is doing here at Montgomery is that we actually wanna send up two accelerometers, right? So we'll have the standard one that Judy sends up, but then we also wanted to have a second one that was taking a profile of a different range, kind of like what Judy stated. But I think one of the things that would be really interesting, really interesting is to be able to see what all of our sensors, right, across different ranges are actually collecting. So I definitely think this is a great opportunity for us to not have uniform data collection. Although I think even that would be interesting as well to see if we get correlations, right? And those averages end up being the same or if we get something different and then we think about why it is that we might've gotten different um, vibration profiles in that way. And then being able to compare that to what Blue Shift actually is collecting as well, right? As it is their maiden flight, right? They're also collecting this data and they're, they'll be highly interested to see what that comparison looks like. Um, and then the other thing that we're also going to try to fly is a vibration sensor in particular as a PISIO sensor, and then make those backwards correlations to see if our vibration sensor is consistent once we decompose the acceleration data to be able to see kind of where that frequency exists and if that frequency is consistent. Because if we can state that we see the same frequency as being highlighted right between T 10 seconds to T 25 seconds, right? Then we have we have pretty good confidence in this idea that, you know, at that frequency, right, we have the greatest amount of vibration, right? And, you know, in which direction it ends up being, right? Our accelerometer might be able to give us some of that information as well. So it seems like there's some comments coming through uh, based off some of the things that I said. So what I'll do is go ahead and open up the floor to that. 
Uh, Daniel, yes, thank you very much. So what I was doing is that while, while you were while you were chatting, I actually put together I put together a payload. So what it is is that your extended core is going to be on the edge, and then you've got you've got an ability to to fly six X chips. So um, what I have here is that I have the light sensor. Um, Biak has done a, a, a three D printing file, so that um, uh, what you can do is that you can actually have a little mirror tile, of one uh, these tiny little mirror mosaic that you can get from Amazon. So we've we've got a whole bunch of those, and we you know and um, and so what you can do is you can three D print uh, a forty five degree uh, mirror angle. So that you could actually, you know, you if, if you were near the, the window or something like that, you'd be able to get some ambient light, the accelerometer. And what I've done is that I put my accelerometer in the middle of this board, um, so that so that it's uh, it's positioned uh, in the middle rather than at, at an end. I'm in the barometer. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be flying. I'm gonna be flying my my temperature and a relative humidity uh, sensor anyway. And the reason for that is that zero is also a value. You know, if we've got zero humidity, that's also a value. And it's going to be really interesting to see how, how that changes. Um, and then, of course, yes, I do want to be able to measure the, the temperature. And then what I've done is I, in order to make up the six chips, I've actually got two blanks here. I've got one of the prototype boards here, which doubles up as a blank chip, a mechanical blank. And then I've got my blue shift one over here. So... So there's 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 plenty of available payload space basically um, for you. You've you've got you've got six slots here, you know, to be able to to fill up. And then going back to the accelerometer, um, what we also need to consider is we need to consider where are we in the payload bay, where our where our accelerometer is uh, relative to our own kit. Um, and then where we are in terms of of the of the payload bay itself. So uh, yesterday I had a great conversation with uh, with uh, Professor Massa from uh, uh, Pennsylvania State University, and what they're going to be doing is that they're going to be attaching um, they're going to be attaching an accelerometer to the actual strut of the payload bay so that they've actually got an accelerometer on the frame of the rocket, of the payload bay. So that's going to be really interesting then to actually start comparing all of the, all of the data that we have. So I, what I would recommend is that everybody flies the accelerometer. We just take note of your position, your position uh, on your board, and then where you are in the stack. So what we're going to have is we're going to have uh, three Q, 3U CubeSat frames, and then there's uh, 15 of these boards per 3U. Um, and then we're going to have four of those uh, integrated into the rocket. So, um, so yeah, we're all going to be in a different position in that payload bay. So we're going to actually have this very much a 3D model of what happens in that payload bay as it goes up you know, as it shakes and, uh, and and all of that kind of thing. So it's going to be a great big data exercise. Uh, I don't think a spreadsheet's going to handle it. We're probably going to have to upload it to 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 um, a, another database, maybe Microsoft Azure or something like that, that can actually you know r run that kind of analysis. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, when we had uh, our our previous IMU um, accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer on the International Space Station for four weeks. There was so much data that came from that that we actually had to use um, a, a big data database to to analyze it because uh, we we couldn't just do it using a normal spreadsheet. Um, so yeah, so there's um, there's a number of opportunities, um, but I think that if we when when we yeah, when we talk about the payload science, it's kind of like, what do you, what, what experiment do you want to run? What do you want to learn? What is the science you want to conduct using the sensors that you have? Um, and then based on what you want to do, then we, next week we start looking at the engineering of that. Um, but now Julie is going to keep quiet.
and let other people get a word in. I'm going to need help with the web or with the uh, spreadsheets for the accelerometer groups. I put the link down there, but you guys will have to glance at it and tell me what to put in it. You're on mute, Judy. It was, I loved what you said though. Yeah, I know. Fantastic. <laughs> Award winning. Not remember it. <laughs> Award winning. Yeah. But it's gone now. Um, yeah, <laughs> Rob, thank you. Thank you very much. And Daniel and I will certainly, uh, will certainly uh, assist you with that. And yeah, I think everybody, let's all just chip in and work out how we're going to do this. I think it's going to be great. Good. Um, uh, Judy, Nico, yeah. Hello, Nico. Just a question on the camera. The camera is going to be on a, on a fly lead, um, not fly lead, a ribbon cable rather. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm just thinking logistically why. So if there's a lot of cameras, it can be quite uh, busy. <laughs> um, so, you know, if every of the wafers have got a camera on, or is it not necessarily the case? Nico, you know the thing is that they 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 they're not they're not very high resolution cameras. You know they these small Raspi cameras on a on a little ribbon cable. They they tiny. So um, yeah, Bjarke certainly has considered that, um, but uh, he's uh, no, he, he's he's not he's not too concerned about it. Um, what we what we probably aren't going to be doing is downloading the the camera data um using the down link you know um and uh another thing is as well is that there are some groups who have who have two payloads so uh maybe what they'll do is that they'll only fly a camera on one of them or something like that um yeah uh i hope that answers your question nico um rob yes back to you please don't you have to have fcc approval to put a camera on We've run into that in the past. Okay. That, so that's actually not true anymore. So that actually changed within the last year and a half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. And like right right now, that's kind of like the big thing. So like uh -huh. you can, if it's a commercially available device, you you are clear to fly it. So like GoPros would be is, is the common example. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and then the so the other thing now that's also kind of huge in that space and that they'll be talking about a lot at the upcoming CubeSat developers workshop is specifically the maneuvering of of Pico satellites mm -hmm. and small sats, and because that's that's the big thing that the FCC or not FCC um, FAA is going to be requiring is that not just the, not just having a kill switch to be able to communicate, but you also need to be able to actually maneuver and put your Pico put your small sat into a D orbit into a uh, into an orbit that'll burn up as wow. well. So that's that's kind of like the big thing right now is to, is a lot of people are figuring out how they're gonna either yeah. orientate right and figure out the orientating of their of their satellites and then also the actual mechanisms used to get their satellites into that deorbiting. Wonder how they'll. Uh, that's just intriguing stuff right there because no one can depend on their batteries lasting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, so I think I think all of that right now is kind of like a big, like these are big wrenches being thrown into, into the <laughs> whole system here. Right, um, right. But, but I'm, I'm hoping there are very smart people that come up with very creative solutions. Right, right. Yeah. I suppose you could reserve battery power specifically for that purpose or something. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's what we have to solve, right? <laughs> the world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, pointing, um, you know, yeah, and orientation. And, and I think that, yeah, certainly in terms of being able to deorbit, um, uh, that, that's what we're finding um, is, uh, is really uh, very attractive at the moment, is actually launching to, to low, relatively low altitudes um, so that they deorbit fast. Um, and also from, you know, Daniel and I feel that then we'll be able to have a full mission definitely within an academic year. 
you know, um, and also it, what it does is that it means that we, we don't get into the, we don't get in the way, we don't get into the traffic at the high altitudes and also um, there's no space debris, uh, you know, so, so the thing is that the, the lower altitudes are, 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 are a lot more, are a lot more popular. And what's great with the lower altitudes as well is because there's, there's a lot more drag. So, you know, that, that re, you know, they, they de orbit very, very quickly. And yeah, our, 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 our tagline on the FinSat program was six days in space. And we never got six days, but, you know, that was kind of like wishful thinking of six days. You know, that would be a long mission. <laughs> I think for six days. Three orbits. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so um, there are there are a number of. I actually I, earlier today I was on a call with the team who do pocket cubes, and they've got these fantastic tiny little cameras. So for those of you who don't know, a pocket cube is fifty millimeters by fifty by fifty. So it's tiny. You could literally put it in your pocket. Um, so it's. Um, it's a quarter of the size of a, of a cube set. So yeah, five centimeters by five by five. And what they have is they've got these wonderful um, Earth observation cameras that they can fly, that they have actually flown in these pocket cubes. Um, and they, they, make for, they make for really great um, constellations. And um, so yeah, because the thing is that what the FCC and the FAA really want as well is that they can, they can detect the satellite. So as long as you have um, solar panels folding out, et cetera, so you, you look bigger than you are. Um, you know, in Africa, we talk about how an elephant flaps its ears to make itself look a lot bigger. You know, so I've got this image of these tiny little satellites flapping their big elephant ears to say, look, I'm here, I'm bigger than you think I am. Um, so yeah, um, so that's, uh, yeah cameras it's it's okay nowadays it's it's okay nowadays uh, to to do that uh good so uh daniel yes thank you very much for for that update um in terms of in terms of that uh, in terms of that news um great anybody else wanting to who, who's got some ideas of of of, of and it doesn't matter how crazy it may seem um, you know, uh, most everything starts with a dream. Um, any any ideas of the kind of payload that you would want to have? Um, maybe we we discuss that and brainstorm things a little bit. I previously mentioned it in a call two or three weeks ago, but we're trying to do uh, we tried to do it on FinSat and then we didn't get powered up. COVID caused, I guess, things not to get battery charged or something when they were sitting in the in the loading bay or something. <laughs> we're not real happy about that, but. Um, so we were trying to do bit flip of EPROMs and, uh, and RAM, not EPROMs, but RAM. Um, so when they get hit by gamma particles and stuff like that, the bits will sometimes flip. And we were going to do like three, three or four chips in a row, one of them hardened, one of them not. Um, and, you know, some different things like that, different brands of chips and see whether they lose their data. So we'd yes. be just writing, writing ones and zeros and then scanning it or writing all zeros and then scanning it um, constantly, you know, and something like that. But. That's what our yeah. last flight was supposed to be that didn't work. So uh, yeah, yeah, and you would you would actually really want more exposure to space. Yeah, this is outside, like yeah. a pretty short flight, but you you, you never know. All right. Yeah, you never you know. Like, you can get it like a hit per hour, or something, right? So it's like, <laughs> oops, missed it. <laughs> so, yeah. Although it's more up in space than it is down on the ground. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, I was going to say for that amount of time that the payload bay windows open, right? Like, because the, the the cosmic ray count should be should go through the roof. Yeah. Right, for that amount of time, right. what we, one of the things that we had actually been talking about is whether or not that payload bay would be RF transparent, mm -hmm. and if it is, then we would assume that we should see a count increase, right? As you as you go up, and then if if in fact those you know, those particles are capable of, of actually flipping those bits, then we should see the rate at which the bits flip increase right, as, right. as you can see too. So that's you know, actually, at least two thin sats, both that didn't power up one after the other, um, that had um, 
maybe three, I can't remember. And a lot of them didn't power up, not because yeah. of us, which really frustrates us. But um, uh, where we had a gamma particle, what, that 300 and some dollar gamma particle detector on there. And then the next thing was to, be, well, and then the last sat I think we put up was supposed to have the bit flip detection and it didn't power up either. So, um, so it's just something we're like, oh, let's repeat that again now. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> and so, yeah. so we tell yeah. students, you're learning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, speaking of speaking of doing so, actually, so uh, my students flew a flew a CubeSat model last year um, as part of a CTE challenge, um, and this year what they want to do is actually still do the same mission. So actually, ours is related to pressure. Um, it's a it's a secondary measurement of pressure, but what they want to do is they want to use sound as a measurement of that. So the idea that sound travels through right um, air particles, so in the same way, that a medium. They be able yeah. to Right, and they should be able to get a measurement for that pressure using sound. So if they have a fixed, um, a fixed uh, wavelength that is being heard, and then they know if they can measure that distance ahead of time, things like that, then they should be able to see as the as that uh, as either the volume of the sound drops or the pitch changes. Right, then they should be able to get a measurement for how it is that the pressure is changing, knowing what it is at atmosphere at atmospheric right. level and then be able to cross correlate that and backwards correlate it. So yeah. having that secondary measurement of pressure. And then, you know, if we do end up applying the barometer as well, then we should be able to get right. a true reading and then make that comparison and see exactly what the difference is. So oh, that's cool. pretty yeah. excited about that one. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And um, during this week, I've, I've had discussions with the team leaders of, of two teams who, who are really looking at, um, um, radiation sensors uh, in terms of Geiger counters, uh, you know, so they, um, they, they, they pretty um, uh, power, power hungry um, and, uh, and also can be very, very delicate. So we'll see, um, we'll see if they want to do that or not. But yeah, also to, to have a look at, you know, uh, certain certain uh, um, wavelengths of radiation, uh, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and uh, I know that William Edmondson. Um, I think he's got a group. I think William's got a group working out of um, an ODU, Old Dominion University. Uh, unfortunately, William couldn't be with us on the call today. Um, but what they're looking at is using uh, the effectiveness of using light for communication. And what happens? Are they able to communicate during the, the vibration um, of, the, of the launch, uh, et cetera? You know, what, what actually happens in, uh, with, with that? Um, because we had this opportunity that our kits are going to be running during the launch. You know, we're not going to go through the launch and then only power up. Um, we're going to be running all the way through, which could be really, really interesting. Um, one, one of the things that we really wanted to look at uh, in, in the FinSAT program uh, was um, to really study the um, South Atlantic anomaly. Um, if any of you know about the, the South Atlantic anomaly, what it is, is that uh, it's an area uh, in... Um, in, around the South Atlantic, and what it does, it, it's it's where our um, magnetic field is is not as strong, um, and so it, we we detect uh, higher levels of, of radiation, uh, solar radiation in those in those areas, and what it does is that it, it uh, the South Atlantic anomaly it it, it breathes with the seasons, so. Um, and so what's really interesting is that um, uh, in South Africa from Cape Town, what we do is that uh, twice, twice a year, we launch our icebreaker called Agalus 2, because what it does is it takes crews to Antarctica to, uh, and it takes uh, supplies and it takes uh, you know, change, uh, uh, crew changes to, to Antarctica. And when they, when they sail, from Cape Town to the South African base on Antarctica, they actually go through that zone of the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, and so what they do is that they, they, really, they, they measure that quite a lot you know, but from sea level, literally sea level. Um, uh, because also, you know, I mean, the thing is that the ionosphere 
is very useful for us in terms of radio communication because we bounce radio waves off our ionosphere, you know, the bottom of the ionosphere. And so the, 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 the thickness of the ionosphere is actually really, really important to us from a communication perspective. Um, so, so yeah, we, we were looking forward to doing that. Um, I guess what we need to do is we, we need to find somebody who can launch us from there, um, from that kind of area, or otherwise what we need to do is we need to, we need to start getting some um, orbital launches, but that's, that's going to come uh, fast. Mm -hmm. It's the way we're working at the moment, yeah. Uh, anybody else with, with some ideas? Um, Declan, if you're still there, come on, you're, you're full of ideas. Reza, you are also very, very, very full of ideas. And Megan, um, please don't be shy. Um, okay, great. So anything else? Uh, we've already been going for almost an hour, so I am a little bit concerned that uh, um, I, I don't want to I don't want to interrupt everybody's school day. So um, uh, anything else we should cover? So next week we're going to look at the engineering aspects of um, at the engineering aspects of how do we put our payload together and what are we getting? Uh, it's Milena. Hi, Milena. Um, I was just wondering, it's just occurred to me, I'm speedballing here. Um, you said it's around 100 kilometers, right? Mm. The satellite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's actually um, the so-called Karman line, the line yes. where it's considered officially sort of that the atmosphere and it doesn't end there, but it's considered 99% of the atmosphere is below that. So yes. I'm wondering if we are going to be able to detect some um, kind of uh, uh, differences in some of the atmospheric um, uh, atmospheric elements be below that and above that. That's going to be interesting to research. It just occurred to me. I'm going to have to do more research into that because uh, yes. for that line to be so so distinguished, there should be some things that occur. And maybe we can concentrate on seeing that. It's going to be very interesting. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And yeah, the the definition of the common line is the the altitude at which um, the uh, dispersion of the light from the atmosphere is so low that what that what it looks like a night sky during the day. So that's kind of the definition. And so what happens is that, that it's not strictly at 100 kilometers. It moves also with the seasons because our, our atmosphere expands and contracts actually with, with the seasons. You know, as, as, you, as you mentioned the other day, you know, high pressure and low pressure, you know. Yeah. So, so the thing is that, um, and that's why there's this debate where uh, some some people say 80 kilometers is fine. Um, that is in space, technically in space. And others will say, no, it has to be 100 kilometers. You know, so or whether you're rich. 120. Yeah, or 120 or something, you know. So it depends on whether you're Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos, you know, where you say space is. Um, you know, so so the thing is that, yeah, it's a, it's um it's a, it's an, it's an atmospheric pressure level. As you say, 99% yeah. of the atmosphere is below the common line, wherever that may be. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you know, the thing is that what we need to consider is what, what would the atmosphere comprise? It would comprise only the less dense, dense gases. So um, we certainly know that oxygen O2 is, is denser than nitrogen N2. Yeah, so we could so we're not going to have any oxygen there we are, it's very unlikely we're going to have any oxygen there we we're going to have um we're going to have a helium we're going to have hydrogen um we may have a bit of argon uh maybe i don't know argon's also pretty heavy 
uh, I mean, dense. So, so yeah, let's, uh, yeah, it's maybe, maybe that's what we need to look for. Maybe we, maybe we should have a look at a, a particular gas sensor that could detect those molecules or those atoms. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, if it's helium, it's a molecule and an atom. Is um, to check the, how the light is reflected or absorbed there. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. That's it. That's it. It's going to be very, very interesting. I'll yeah. have to do my research on that. Thank you. No, it's an absolute pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Great. Um, Reza, um, hi, Judy. Can you just reiterate on what ideas we need to come up with? Reza, what we're looking for is what experiment would you like to conduct, considering that you have an experiment that is going to fly into space, have anywhere between three and six minutes of weightlessness and then return. Um, so what, what ideas, crazy ideas do you want to come up with to, to be able to do that? Um, uh, yeah, one, one, of, one of the other uh, ideas that's being, excuse the plan, floated uh, at the moment is um, more of an art project. And that is to have a, a tiny little prism um, and have uh, um, uh, a beam of light, white light, and then the prism, and then uh, with the camera, actually detect the patterns that are created by the prism and the splitting of the light. You know, it could actually be really, really interesting, um, kind of like a, you know, uh, art, the artistic, the light. Uh, curve or whatever it may be painting or movie um, as it goes through the flight that that could really be quite something quite interesting um, to see that happen um, maybe what we also want to do is maybe we want to fly uh, some some vials maybe some petri dishes and things like that um, we could always we could always look at something like that um, one of, the, one of the very interesting things, uh, experiment that I heard of a number of years ago now, is that, um, oh, Megan, before I carry on talking, please, you have your hand up. Um, hi, Judy, can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can. Um, I wanted to know, do any of the sensors like, can you program it to make sounds? I was just thinking that now, because you were talking about art. Yes. Could any of this like, like make sounds maybe? Uh, definitely, definitely. And um, I, I, um, um, Daniel mentioned earlier that what his students are doing is um, having a look at the, the um, being, being using, using sound waves to measure the, maybe the, the atmospheric pressure. Um, so certainly, Ria, what you could do is you could have a speaker. You could have a speaker and then you could have a microphone, a, a small little microphone, and you could see, you know, what, what are we able to pick up? Because, you know, the assumption is that, well, we, we do know that sound waves need a medium to move through, whether it is uh, air, water, gas, you know, solid, whatever it may be. So the theory says, I guess, I'm just I'm thinking aloud. The theory says that as you as you increase in altitude and your your atmosphere thins and thins and thins, the the sound that you can hear should become less and less and less and less. So I guess your volume should go down. I don't know. Maybe your pitch changes as well, because maybe maybe it affects the wavelength and the frequency. So uh, and and the pitch. So maybe it actually yeah maybe it plays a little bit of a tune with also with the vibrations. Maybe we've got like some pressure bursts or something like that. So you could have some tunes. Um, yeah. And then also what you could do is that you know, um, music, music is really waves and, you know, music and mathematics are very, very closely uh, related. So maybe what you could do is maybe you could actually interpret, let's say the acceleration data um, in a musical form, something like that. Um, you know, you could take the data and convert that to to sound something. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a musician. It could sound terrible, of course. Could sound well, like uh, could sound like impromptu jazz or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
um, what if what if we were able to use the senses to detect what frequencies our ears would be able to listen to music at? Would that possibly be an idea we could explore? That could be very, very, very interesting. So, in other words, as as the pressure changes dramatically, would we actually be able to hear more or less um, yeah. at different different uh, frequencies? Megan, that that yeah. could be something that's very, very, very interesting. Um, Around about 20 years ago, my, my brother, Charles Sandrock, he, he was involved in a project on the west coast of Africa with the, the sand populations. What they, they've, got, they've got languages that have got a lot of clicks in them. And, um, and because of the, the, the pitch of the clicks, uh, they've got the highest percentage of deaf pe population in the world because, of the, because what it is is that when we go deaf, we don't, it's not really a volume thing. It's more of a pitch thing. Um, the band is narrow of, of what we can hear. And uh, yeah, and so my, my brother was there with uh, a bunch of linguists and they were, they were recording the language and the clicks. Um, and then what they did is that they designed hearing aids for people to lower the frequency or narrow the frequency gap and then they could hear again. So they could understand the language again. So yeah. Um, Maybe maybe it's got something to do with pressure. It could. You never know. Um, could be very 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 interesting. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. I really like that. Um, I do know that Bjork has been having a look at uh, microphones, little microphones to put on the chips, uh, more to measure decibels rather than anything else. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that could be very interesting. Yeah. You would want to have a speaker. You would want to have a very, your, your, your output of your sound. You'd want to have it a very, very specific frequency, um, or pitch so that you could then measure those changes. That, that could be very interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, great. Okay, um, Reza, is it possible we can test plants in the Palo Bay, like having a plant that is a succulent, which has plenty of water versus a regular plant to test how they react to the atmosphere over 100, above 100 kilometers? That could be really, really interesting. Yes, because what you could do is you could, you could fly leaves. And you've got, you, you've got, You've got this volume, you've got this, you've got quite a bit of surface area. And then also what you have is you actually have two centimeters or 20 millimeters in, in depth. You certainly could. You could definitely uh, have a, a succulent in there. Um, yeah, that, that could be that could be really, really interesting. Um, because that could uh, that could really feed into um, what crops we could grow. Um, let's say, for example, I mean, I know it's a bit of an extre extreme case, but you know, the, the Martian atmosphere is a lot thinner than ours. So the atmospheric pressure on Mars is, is a lot lower. But maybe if we had plants that could survive in a, in a much lower atmosphere, um, then we wouldn't have to pressurize those, those greenhouses as much, that kind of thing. Um, good. Um, because then Reza is saying, because we can test what vegetables and plants we can take into space, we can go to Mars. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Because we are, we're going to Mars. Um, and then Rob is saying, I thought the other day, one of the Zoom calls said that we will have 10 millimeters, not 20. Okay. Yes, Rob, you, you're very right. Between, yeah. We budgeted on 10, but the thing is that now that we actually have all of the hardware per one U, we're only budgeting for five slots. So therefore we actually have 20 millimeters. Okay. Um, what we're also looking at is if people don't want to take up all of that space, if they don't need to take up all of that space, what we could do is in the three U canister, 
we could we could stack some really close together and then others can have more space you know because it this is this is really a, a very collaborative project so um so yeah we could we could do something like that yeah definitely uh declan yes please sorry i'm just thinking um we're with with possible ideas um i was thinking that a lot could probably be done with solar radiation or just general uh radiation you would be exposed to at that height and i was just thinking um if you could 3d print little little casings um and put them on like slot them in where you would have the chips and then you can fill it with uh i can't remember the exact way to do it but i know there is a way where you can fill these canisters with a medium to detect the amount of energy being entered into the system from solar radiation and what i was thinking here is depending on different points in the flight uh, differences in location and altitude you can measure the intensity of the solar radiation and more so specifically how varied it gets whether it's average uh, across like uh, from one point to mm -hmm. 10 kilometers away same altitude or if it's extremely variable where you've got bursts from uh, entanglement of like like pockets almost mm -hmm. or bursts of that would be pretty interesting to see um the spread of solar radiation yes you're very right because we can't assume that it's just a straight line but it's it, it could be it could be exponential relating to to altitude or something but also i mean as, as melena showed us the other day how the the temperature gradient varies as we go through, you know, the, the troposphere and the mesosphere and all of that kind of thing. Maybe that's also what happens with the solar radiation is it could be could be doing this as well. Could be very, very interesting. Yes, Declan, I really like that. Um, let's, yeah, let's definitely pursue that. Um, Milena, you're very right. If the payload is not pressurized, the temperature go, could go to like minus 60 and the plants may die. Absolutely, they may die. They may, the cells will probably expo, explode. That, you know what, that's okay. Um, uh, Reza, I'm, I'm not sure who's going to want to fly next to you because they're going to be like full of vegetation by the time they get back. But hey, take the risk. <laughs> Talking about bugs on the windscreen. We'll go next to them. We'll detect how much risk there is to fly with another group. <laughs> I like that. I have all these disclaimers. Um, <laughs> Declan, I see your hand still up. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Um, we should definitely communicate in like a co collaboration kind of setting for space wise. Because I noticed when you're talking about your payload, you said you used two of the chips, which mm. were completely blank. Yeah. Mm. So if we could possibly communicate together, say mm. for for those blank chips, I mean, you want to be using the space as efficiently as possible. Mm. So someone might have an idea to make mm. a little box which could fit mm. into that space mm. with a leaf or water, mm. or whatever, mm. just to have mm. more efficiently used mm. space yeah yeah absolutely like ride share kind of thing Declan absolutely and, and and that is why it's really really great with us having all the different groups and uh yeah um and that's also why we have the discord channel is so that we can we can make sure that we that we communicate with each other and we partner together and we we do these things so that we don't have any waste um that would be such a tragedy yeah with flying people you know judy flying her blanks uh yeah it's a real waste um good um reza's gonna put a little warning sign on his pot plant that's great thank you like beware the vegetation kind of thing but where 
high flying exploding leaves. Um, we'll, we'll put a camera to detect if you followed the rules. That's yeah, what we'll exactly, do. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Nico, there you go. Great application for your camera. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> oh, terrific. Okay, everybody, um, uh, is that it? Uh, you know what, we can, we're definitely going to continue this discussion next week when we look at how we're actually going to engineer these things. So, yeah, please, more and more and more ideas. That'll be absolutely fantastic. Okay. Um, good. Uh, is that it? Okay. Great. Um, Rob, I'm not sure if you want to stay on for a few, two minutes. Um, I just wanted to catch up with you. So if that's okay. <laughs> don't worry, you're not being, you're, you're not at school. You don't have to go to the principal. The principal's office. office. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, please, please make sure that you're collaborating in the, in the Discord channel, uh, just uh, on the Discord server. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing you all next week. Thanks, Judy. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye. Cheers.